Uh, welcome everyone to this um, webinar, um, our last uh, event of the, of the year. Um, I'm Tony Roskilly, I'm Professor of Energy Systems here at Durham University and I lead uh, the uh, EPSRC Network Plus in hydrogen fuel transportation. So this uh, event is organized through that network um, and is part of a series of uh, webinars um, looking into different aspects of hydrogen research in the in the transport sector. So this week uh, we welcome two uh, speakers on the subject of hydrogen production and supply for transportation. So uh, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our first uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Sheila Samsasti. She's uh, from uh, University of Bath, and she's going to present on whole system hydrogen value chain optimization. Sheila is a, an assistant professor in the Department of uh, Chemical Engineering at Bath. Um, she is a member of the Science Expert Group of the UK Government uh, Department uh, Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and uh, provides independent scientific and technical support space uh, and the scientific uh, chief scientific advisor. She's a PI on uh, various projects funded by EPSRC, Bayes, Newton Fund, STFC, etc. And these are um, in developing sustainable systems and value chain models for um, key uh, natural and emerging, emerging resources and also leads her group at the, in the department in Bath. Um, so uh, without further ado, over to you, Sheila. Okay, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me. I have just shared my screen, so I hope you can see that too. So first of all, I would like to thank Tony for the kind introduction. And uh, I'm grateful to Jackie and Tony for organizing this webinar and their invitation to present my work on hydrogen value chains. So I would like to start by briefly summarizing my research, which is neatly captured by this image, which was featured in a Royal Society of Chemistry journal. So my research is about developing large optimization models of value chains to supply products and services in the most efficient and sustainable manner. So a value chain is a network of processes or activities required to obtain raw materials and primary resources and convert them into useful products and services, along with logistics such as distribution, transportation, storage, and inventory management. So along the supply chains, there are many interdependent decisions involved. So for example, for green hydrogen value chains, such decisions include how many wind turbines and solar farms to build of each type and where, where to install electrolyzers, how to transport the electricity and or hydrogen, how much grid reinforcement is needed and how much hydrogen pipeline network needs to be built, where to store the hydrogen and how to manage its inventory and what services to use the hydrogen for. So heat, transport, power, industry, and so on. So there are so many different combinations of these decisions. So I am developing mathematical models and computer algorithms to automatically identify the best set of combinations, which will be useful in making decisions, for example, around land use, location of processing facilities, the levels of production, and the most effective logistics and inventory management policies. So as you can see from my image, I am designing value chains, not just so that they have the lowest cost, but also so that they will be sustainable, will not cause global warming, and will help us achieve net zero, will protect our forests and protect biodiversity, both on land and in the oceans. So many hydrogen technologies are ready for deployment. But the challenge we're facing right now is establishing strong and robust value chains for hydrogen. Modeling and optimization are effective tools to design and explore various hydrogen value chains. So I have developed 
a comprehensive value chain optimization model. And my research group is applying it to hydrogen. So it has many features important for hydrogen, such as line pack, hydrogen, hydrogen injection into gas grids, carbon capture, storage and utilization technologies, underground storage, such as salt caverns, depleted oil and gas fields, negative emission te technologies, and so on, along with alternative technologies such as heat pumps, electric vehicles, and so on. So I will give you more details in the succeeding slides. So the model is called the Value Web Model, or VWM, which is, as I've said, being used in my group to design and analyze various supply chains and energy networks. It is a multi-objective optimization uh, model, meaning that multiple different objectives can be considered simultaneously, such as minimizing cost, minimizing emissions, and so on. It is based on mixed integer uh, programming and, and can simultaneously determine the design, planning, and operation of any integrated multi-vector energy network. The model is data-driven, which means that it's easy to add more networks by simply providing new data for resources and technologies without developing new mathematics and source code. It is technology agnostic, meaning you can compare different technologies, energy vectors, and other options on equal terms. It is very useful for performing portfolio optimization and pathway analysis, so determining the optimal mix of technologies and how the existing energy network should transition over time to meet some future objectives such as net zero emissions. So using the model, you can run a large number of optimization scenarios simply by changing the input data. So the value web model can answer variants of the following problem. Given the spatially and uh, temporally distributed demands for energy services and the availability of primary resources, plus the characteristics of the technologies that convert, store, and transport resources, the model can simultaneously determine the design and operation of any integrated network. So in terms of design, it can determine the location, number, and capacity of generation or conversion and storage technologies, structure of the transport infrastructure network, when and where to purchase or install these, these technologies and the interactions between them. With respect to operation, it can determine which resources to convert, store and transport, how much, where and when, which technologies to use at different times and the transport flows between different regions. Of course, there are a number of constraints that we need to satisfy. We need to meet the um, minimum levels of demands. We need to observe the conservation law and other laws of physics. There are constraints on resources such as land and water, and we cannot exceed a certain budget on costs and GHG emissions. Some technologies are only available at certain times, and we can only build a certain number of them in a year as given by their build rates. There are also social and political constraints such as the siting of the technologies. And then we need to decide what the main purpose of the design is. Is it to minimize cost, minimize environmental impact, or maximize value? And we can explore the trade-off between these objectives using multi-objective optimization. The model has five key elements, time, space, resources, technologies, and infrastructures. So it has a detailed, efficient, and, um, detailed and efficient representation of time that captures both long-term strategic decisions as well as short-term operational issues simultaneously. So long-term strategic decisions occur at yearly level. So these are decisions about investment in facilities. Operational issues such as intermittency of renewables, dynamics of energy storage, variability in demands, operation of individual technologies, and so on, occur at different timescales. So hourly, daily, and or seasonally. So for the optimization scenarios that we run, the planning horizon comprised three to four decades. So from now until 2050 or 2060. And uh, modeling at the hourly level over a planning horizon of decades would result in a very large optimization model that is intractable. And here we have overcome the challenge using this non-uniform hierarchical time disc discretization, which sounds a bit cryptic, but it is, it is explained in detail in this paper along with how we overcame this tractability challenge mathematically. So please check this out if you're interested. 
So the spatial representation is also flexible. The region of study, which could be a city or a country, is divided into a number of cells or zones. And each zone can support uh, any of the activities needed for the energy system to function. So some zones may contain primary energy sources. They can all potentially host technologies that convert or store resources and support infrastructure to transport resources. So the top uh, map shows fairly high uh, spatial resolution, so the UK at the 50 kilometer level. We use this representation for scenarios that only require time scales over seasons and decades. And the bottom map shows the spatial representation we used for scenarios with renewable energy and energy storage, since in this case, the temporal resolution needs to consider at least the hourly level in addition to daily seasonal and decadal time scales in order to capture intermittency of renewables and dynamics of energy storage. So this representation is based on the National Grid seven-year statement study zones. And then we have the resources. So these are materials and energy included in the energy system. So they include raw materials and primary resources such as wind, solar, biomass, natural gas, and so on. Intermediate resources are uh, produced by a technology and then used as input or feedstock to a different technology. Products and energy services are valuable resources that have demands. And waste resources are GHG emissions, waste heat, and so on. So in any supply chain, there are three types of technology. We have the generation or conversion technologies, which transform one set of resources into another set of resources. And then we have storage technologies. So these are used to manage inventory. So for example, warehouses or for gaseous products pressurized vessels and underground storage, such as salt caverns and depleted oil and gas fields. We also have electrochemical batteries for storage of electricity and so on. And then transport technologies, these are used to move resources from one location to another. Okay, and then the last element is infrastructure. So uh, infrastructures support the transport technologies. So for example, for biomass, Transport networks include roads, railways, and inland waterways network. So this map shows that in the UK, there are many canals and rivers uh, that can be used to transport biomass by barges. In the UK, we also have extensive electricity and natural gas grids and heat networks in some areas. And uh, example of emerging infrastructures are pipelines for hydrogen and CO2. So as mentioned, the model can represent any integrated network because the approach is modular. So each element is a building block that can be combined with the others to form the value web superstructure, which contains all of the possible pathways. So resources are represented by circles, conversion technology by rectangles, storage technologies by pentagons, and transport technologies by hexagons. So in the model, each element is governed by a set of parameters and constraints. And you can connect these different building blocks to form any pathways, including linear, circular, and web pathways. So this is very useful for multi-vector networks where you can convert electricity to hydrogen and then hydrogen to ammonia or methanol and then back to hydrogen and then electricity. So this is of course a hypothetical pathway, but you can do that in the model if there is a real pathway like that. So of course the efficiency losses in going around the cycle are all accounted for. Using this approach, the model can consider a wide range of resources and technologies. So we can combine the building blocks for resources and conversion technology to represent a conversion process such as this example. So here resource R1 is an input to technology one, which produces resources R3 and R4, and both are inputs to technology two, which produces uh, resources R1 and R2. So this is an example of a circular conversion pathway. So for example, technology one could be a fuel cell and technology two could be an electrolyzer. So this is a storage process representation. So the put, hold, and get blocks represent the three stages of storage. So charging, maintaining, and discharging. And this representation allows modeling of costs, losses, efficiencies, resource requirements, and emissions at 
uh, each stage of storage. So this is a transport process representation. In this example, resource R2 is transported from zone Z to Z prime, requiring resource R1 from zone Z. So for example, petrol for road transport and generating waste R3 in both zones. So for example, GHG emissions or waste heat. So as mentioned before, you can combine the different blocks to represent energy any energy networks with different energy vectors. So this is one of uh, the complex integrated networks that we recently investigated. And the results were published in this paper. Here you can see that there are many different resources such as solar and wind, natural gas, electricity, biomass, hydrogen, and so on. So due to space limitations, we are we are representing, re, representing resources as ellipses instead of circles. And also the three stages of uh, storage uh, are not shown here, although they are modeled. So the storage, are, the storage facilities are represented here as pentagons. And the three stages of storage are modeled here. So not just the round trip uh, efficiency. Okay, so you can see uh, we have various technologies to convert these resources to uh, different energy services, such as heat and um, electricity. We also have a carbon capture and um, CO2 network of pipelines. So it is a spatial model. So the model will determine which pathways to use in each zone and how to transport resources between zones. So to show you the rigor applied to the model, we obtained the properties of pipelines using simulations in GPROMS using this general dynamic model of a pipe. So GPROMS is developed by Siemens Process Systems Engineering, where our next speaker, Jorge, is working. So later on, he will be presenting how they use GPROMS to model and design electrolyzers for green hydrogen production. So the main concerns with wind turbines are uh, their siting. So here we couple the value web model with GIS to apply various criteria to determine whether a particular site is suitable or not. So for example, for onshore wind, suitable site should have an average wind speed of five meter per second. It should be accessible uh, from the road and can connect to the national grid. It should be far enough away from populated areas, rivers, woodlands, airports, and so on. Applying those 10 constraints to Great Britain, this map shows the uh, suitable areas for onshore wind turbines. Although it may look as though there is a lot of area available for, for onshore wind turbines, it is only about 2% of uh, total area in Great Britain. A similar process was done for offshore wind as well as for solar, both for rooftop and solar far farms. So this slide shows the one for fixed foundation offshore wind, and we are currently working on doing the same thing for floating offshore, offshore wind. So here the green regions show the suitable areas at different distances from the shore. From the shore. So applying the constraints that it should be within the exclusive economic zone, far enough away from shipping lanes, and the water depth should be less than 60 meters. So floating turbines could, um, of course, can be located in deeper waters. And this diagram here shows the uh, area occupied by the turbines on a hexagonal grid using a spacing of five rotor diameters between turbines. So the input data to the model is quite extensive. They are time series that depend on spatial location. So this work is in the realm of big data. As an example, we obtained the uh, hourly time series for wind from Renewables Ninja, which is based on uh, data from NASA. And we projected it into the future using the, climate, the UK climate projection from the Met Office, so UK CP09. And uh, for energy services such as mobility, we obtained time series data for vehicular usage from the Department for Transport. And then we projected it into the future using different S curves as shown. So you can consider many different scenarios simply by changing the data. So for example, by changing the characteristics of this S curve, you can model different rates of uptake or penetration of fuel cell vehicles. You can do the same thing for heat pumps and other emerging technologies. The model captures the trade-off between onshore and 
onshore and offshore generation. As you can see here, the operating uh, cost, operating and maintenance, maintenance cost of turbines and the wind speeds uh, increase with the distance from the shore. So the model will determine the optimal number of onshore and offshore turbines at different distances from the shore. So hopefully by now I have justified that this is indeed a high fidelity optimization model. But if you're not yet convinced, please check out my research group's publications. There the mathematical formulation is presented as well as insights from the scenarios that we optimized using the model. So as already mentioned, the model is flexible and you can do a lot of optimization studies for any integrated network with any number of energy vectors. And you can do this by simply defining the data for the various technologies and resources. So the, the publications on this slide are focused on hydrogen, but we have also applied the model to other supply chains, such as bioenergy, biofuels, and food supply chains. So in the next slides, I will show some example optimization results from a number of different scenarios. So please note that insights need to be drawn from a large number of scenarios, as we have done in the papers. The results on the next slides are really just to illustrate the capabilities of the model. So when you look at the... When you look at the results of a scenario, in order to draw insights from it, you also have to examine the context and compare it with all of the other scenarios. Okay, so however, I don't have time to cover all of that in this presentation. But if you are interested in the insights, then please do take a look at our publications. So the model is able to determine the time phased investment in technologies and infrastructures. So these results were from a scenario using the S curve that I showed earlier for the penetration of fuel cell vehicles. So here you can see the gradual buildup of technologies and infrastructures from no hydrogen demand in, so we did the study uh, uh, in 2016. So the first time period here is 2015 to 2020. And then you can see that the network um, it's getting bigger um, until here in 2050. So th the assumption here is that uh, the domestic transport sector is fully decarbonized. So here the objective was minimization of net present costs. So all costs were discounted back to 2015. So here we can see that both electricity and hydrogen networks are required. And as the demands increase over the years, the network becomes bigger. So the model can also determine the hourly operation of all of the technologies over the entire planning horizon. So here I'm showing the hourly operation of the hydrogen transmission pipeline network during weekdays in summer in 2045 to 2050. So the, these results are from another scenario presented in this paper. So this is to illustrate that the model can determine how much new wind capacity to install onshore and offshore at different distances from the shore. Um, the, the model will also provide the cost breakdown for various components in the network. So this is a cost minimization scenario, but you can also run scenarios with other objectives such as minimize emissions and the results will be different. So please do check out our papers if you're interested because we presented such scenarios there. So the, the model also determines the hourly inventory uh, of any resource in storage at various locations. So here we are looking at hydrogen inventory in four key storage facilities. You can see that hydrogen is being used as seasonal energy storage, both for underground uh, storage and pressure vessels. So if you, zoom, if you zoom in on the profiles, you can see that it is also being used for hourly balancing. So you can just uh, about see it here. So this slide shows some optimization results that we presented in this paper. So these diagrams uh, show the energy system design and operation in 20, 2050 that includes conversion of gas grids to hydrogen. So here you can see that hydrogen and CO2 pipelines are built across Great Britain. You can also see how much of the natural gas distribution network is still in use, uh, converted to hydrogen or no longer in use. Here you can see the optimal operation of storage technologies. Here it is presented for the whole of Great Britain, but, but as I showed you in the previous slide, you can construct uh, such diagrams for each storage technology installed in various locations. So here you can see that as expected, um, underground uh, storage is being used seasonally. 
You can also see pressure vessels and um, distribution and trans transmission grid line pack. So line pack is the inherent storage capability of the gas pipeline networks due to changing the pressure levels. Um, so please do check out this paper if you're interested because um, here we analyzed in detail hydrogen injection into gas grids and gas line pack for storage, both at the distribution and transmission level. Uh, there are, of course, other storage technologies in these scenarios, but these diagrams uh, focus on hydrogen. You can also analyze policy instruments using the model. So here you can see the network for two different levels of feed-in tariff or feet. It is interesting because at low feet, it is injecting green hydrogen into the gas distribution grid at low rates. But at high fits, it is injecting large amounts of blue hydrogen. So here you can see um, SMRs coupled with CCS. So in this diagram, you can see that the level of uh, feed-in tariff affects the overall amount of hydrogen injected into the gas grid. You can generate Sankey diagrams using the results of optimizations. So here I'm presenting a Sankey diagram of the annual energy flows in a net energy zero, in a net zero energy system, which is one of the scenarios we presented in this paper. So this diagram shows the energy flows aggregated over the whole of Great Britain, but you can also generate similar Sankey diagrams for the energy flows in each of the different locations and at different points in time. So you need to provide the model with extensive input data, but in return, it will also generate extensive amounts of output data. So it will show you in great detail the system design and operation across space and time. So as you've seen, the value web model is a flexible tool that can be used to analyze in terms of design, planning, and operation various scenarios for a wide variety of different integrated energy networks with different energy vectors. So you can consider a whole country, a city, or any study region, really, because the model is general and allows you to represent any study area as a number of zones or cells. Or you can also just perform a study using just one zone if you wish. So if you think that this tool would be useful for you and you would like more, more information or are interested in collaborating, then please do get, get in touch. I would also like to mention a new project that I am undertaking on hydrogen value chains for the hard to hard to decarbonize sectors. So the current version of the model has a representation of industry in terms of its heat demands and supplies. But in this new project, I would like it to be more detailed, such as considering the different sectors explicitly. So for example, the steel and cement sectors, uh, we will be modeling explicitly technologies such as direct reduction of iron using hydrogen. So I'll give you more de details later if there is time. But for now, I'll hand over to Jorge from Siemens Process Systems Engineering, who will now give you a presentation on green hydrogen production. But, but very quickly, I would like to acknowledge the following. So for, the, for this work that I presented today, I would like to thank Nuri, who co-developed the mathematical formulation with me, Chris Quarton, who was my PhD student and is now working as an analyst in BASE, who performed and analyzed a lot of great scenario studies using the model, and uh, Ian, Jose, Georgina for their very helpful feedback and co-supervision of my uh, two PhD students. And I would like to thank the funders for funding the scenario development in my research group. And thank you all for your attention. And I'd be happy to answer any questions later.